The following is an interview with the creator of Moonlighting, Glenn Gordon Caron. Glenn was gracious enough to grant us an interview recently, so thank you so much for your time, Glenn. It was an insightful and revealing discussion. Shauna and I hope you enjoy it. Well, hello, Moonlighting fans. Have we got a treat for you today, don't we, Grace? Oh, we sure do, Shauna. I'm very excited about this special guest. Yes, a very special guest, probably the most important guest, because without him, we wouldn't have something to analyze and talk about for the next three plus years. Uh, it's the man, the myth, the legend, Mr. Glenn Gordon Karen. Welcome, Glenn. Hi, and uh, I, not a myth, not a legend, barely a man. <laughs> it's a pleasure to be here in, in Australia and Shanghai at the same time. Amazing. Yes. Um, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you, you didn't know you could travel so fast. I had no idea. I had no <laughs> idea. Um, and I was saying to you before we started, and it's worth saying again, now that you've started to record, how it's just extraordinarily flattering. Um, you know, you make something and you have a tremendous amount of fun doing it and you're um, pretty outrageously compensated for doing it. and. 30 years later, people like you are still talking about it. That's a great gift. Um, so thank you. Yeah, um, I think you, um, you said at one point um, that, you know, back in that day, you, you mentioned to Bruce that people are still talking about this or our kids are watching it, you know, 30 years from now, 20 years from now, 40, almost 40 years from now. Um, right, that, yeah. That's you, not me. I was 11 when I started doing the show. Um, <laughs> of course, so, of course, yeah. No, uh, yeah, sorry. So, yeah, so, I mean, given that it is now 30 plus years later and we are talking about it, what do you think you, that you have created something special in your mind? I think it's either that or there's just not a lot of good stuff out there. I, I can't really <laughs> explain it. Um, no, I think, I think, um, how do you say this without sounding uh, self-consumed and pompous and all that? Um, even when we were making it, my whole thing was, uh, let's make it so good. Let's try and pack it with so much entertainment that you can watch it more than once. And of course, this was in a, a day before there was DVRs and before there was streaming and you would have to wait for an episode to be shown before you could see it. Um, and part of my argument, ABC was always you know, very upset because I would uh, spent a lot of money, frankly. I would continue to make the episode until I felt it was, you know, good enough to show on television. And but I said, but you can show this episode three or four times, and and they did, and it would invariably get a you know 28, 29, 30, 31, 32 share. Um, and I believe a lot of that was, <clears throat> you know, first of all, the the incredible magnetism of Bruce and Sybil, but also. It, the episodes moved so quickly and were so packed with, with jokes and double entendres and all sorts of you know hidden things that you could watch it more than once and enjoy it a second time and you know all of that and uh, uh, it's very very obviously very gratifying to see that people still do that. Oh yeah, we talk about that all the time. I mean, two, three, or you know, fifty times. Um, and you know, when Grace and I talk about these episodes each week. We are always seeing something different. We're figuring out the plots even all these years later. And you know, <laughs> your, you know, your play on words and you know, always a double entendre and things like that, you know, just make it um, really fun to watch, you know, over and over and over again. So yeah, I think you're you're so right about that. You know? um, so yeah, today what we want to try to do is ask you some questions that as fans for you know, lifelong fans that um we maybe haven't heard you talk about or go into it, you know, as depth as, um, as we've heard you talk about it before. Um, so let's see how long your memory is, Glenn. Yeah, good luck. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, whatever, whatever you can give us. Um, but just one, one thing I don't think I've ever um, heard um, the answer to is the title, Moonlighting. Was that given to you or was that a title that you came up with? And what does that title mean to you? This is a strange story, but I promise you it's true. Um, right. I had, a, I had a deal with ABC. I was under contract to ABC and I was supposed to write three pilot movies of the week. 
And um, I had written and we produced the first two and um, they really liked them, but the feeling was that given the, the times and this was the middle, uh, the early eighties, like 83, uh, 84, that they were probably a little too arty for the room. I, I was a big snob and didn't have much interest in, in working in television, quite frankly. I wanted to make movies. Um, yeah. so, so whatever I did, I always tried to make it like a movie uh, as, as sort of a calling card for the movies. Um, so when we came to the last, the last piece that I owed them, they said, this is what we want you to do. The first two were things that I wanted to do. Now they said, okay, since you failed twice, we want you to do, they called it a boy girl detective show. And they were referencing things like heart to heart, which was a big success mm -hmm. on the network, things like that. Um, so I, I thought, oh gosh, I don't want to do that. I had spent um, almost a season on Remington Steel. Um, and while I have great affection for Pierce uh, and I haven't seen Stephanie in an awfully long time, so I, I don't want to be presumptuous to say uh, I have great affection for her, but I, I certainly did it at the time, and it was, it was a fascinating experience. It wasn't a genre that held any fascination for me. There, if you remember, there were detective shows all over television back then. Yeah. Um, they were the space science fiction uh, of its time, you know, in a way that now we're, we're constantly going off to you know, blue screen worlds, back then it was detective agencies and car chases as opposed to. Um, but I came up with an idea that I liked a lot, which was fundamentally the idea that, that Moonlighting became, which is about a woman who's a model who uh, loses all her money and has to close down all these businesses that were created to lose, to lose money for taxes, et cetera, et cetera. And I went in and told the story to ABC. And they liked the story a lot. Um, and I swear to you, as I was leaving, I, I walked out of a gentleman named Jordan Kerner's office, I believe it was. I walked out of his office, the meeting had clearly gone well. And I was walking away and I heard a voice, the door open, a voice called Glenn. And I turned around and I believe it was Jordan Kerner. Uh, he said, what's it called? And I said, moonlighting. And as God is my witness, I have no idea where that came from. I had <laughs> no idea what it meant. I yeah. just thought, yeah, that's what this is. And I realized later that subconsciously, I must have intuited or something that, that, that this was a show about two people living a life that was never meant to be their main life. They were moonlighting. This was never supposed to be their real job. This was supposed to be, I mean, for the Bruce Willis character, clearly he thought, well, this is the job of a lifetime. I don't have to make any money. I don't have to make a profit. I don't have to do anything. And I will have fulfilled my function. So I can party and live hard and do whatever I want to do. And for Civil Shepherd, oh, here's a business I can open up and pay no attention to. There was also something romantic about it. There was something evocative about it. I liked the way it sounded, but I, I swear to you, I, I, and, and it, I marvel at my own stupidity sometimes that, that I would go into a, a network to try and sell them something without giving a moment's thought to what is it called. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, I'd be lying to you if I said, well, after a great deal of contemplation, moonlight, yeah. moonlight um, the truth is it just came out of my mouth and then sort of stuck. Honestly, you couldn't come up with a better title. I mean, if you had to sat down with a group of people in, in a boardroom trying to come up with a title, it wouldn't have been as great as that title. You know, I think part of it too may have come from, I was... This will be it. This will be where you want to cut stuff out. I was a, a huge fan of Frank Capra films, which were Frank Capra was a fantastic director um, back in the 30s and 40s and all his movies, maybe with the exception of the last two were made in black and white. And they were shot by, uh, I'm trying to remember the cinematographer's name, but he was just fantastic. And he may have written an article called Moonlighting or referred to Moonlight or, or just referred to it as a, 
a source, not that they actually shot to Moonlight or with Moonlight, but that they were trying to, you know, reference Moonlight in the, in the lighting setup or something. I don't know. I've always been fascinated by all that kind of stuff. So that it may have come subconsciously from there, but I, I didn't plan it. Um, it really honestly just rolled out of my, embarrassingly, just rolled out of my mouth. Um, yeah. So. It works. No, it, yeah, yeah, it works. You know? Not good. <laughs> <laughs> luckily. luckily. Hmm. Um, all right. So now throughout the series, um, I'm always amazed when I, when I watch these episodes of, about the, uh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's about all of it. Um, you know, deeper into, you know, the, the script writing, um, the things that repeated in Moonlighting, um, for example, you know, just even uh, like we know, you know, the feet coming out of the elevator or door slams. I'd know that slam anywhere. Or, you know, sometimes that they would walk through doors together and kind of, um, you know, knock into each other. Let's see if I can just find the apartment key. But also the dialogue, you know, like the Maddie, 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 David, David, David. Maddie, 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 what are you doing, doing, doing? David, 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 I'm leaving, leaving, leaving. Or fine, right. fine, good. Fine. Fine. Good. Good. Or like always quips about like dumb David or, you know, thinking like you were doing right. what? But then when I started thinking, I said, wait a minute, something's wrong what? here. She's not really married. And, and things like that. So um, I always wondered, is that something that you always put into the script yourself and it was just built into the script or, or maybe it's a combo um, on set did, you know, Sybil or Bruce or you or, you know, someone else on set say this might be a good place for one of these repeating lines. Um, because no, it was, it was almost always in the script. Um, the scripts were, and the first one to figure it out was Bruce, frankly. Um, the scripts are, are, this is going to sound very artsy, artsy, pretentious. The scripts are actually rather musical. They have a cadence. Um, yeah. So much so that Bruce would call me, this was back in the days when there were like rotary phones on the sets. And <laughs> so he would call up to the office and he'd go, you better get down here and listen with your stuff. And it was, what he meant was they didn't understand the rhythm that there was a rhythm to it all. Um, and that without the rhythm, it fell apart because it didn't live in the real world. It was a, you know, it was this very sort of particular world in which they operated. There was enough that felt like reality around them that allowed you to sort of give that part of yourself up and, and sort of take the, the journey with them. But, but the world itself had its own its own sort of unique musical rhythms. In fact, and a lot of the rhythms were stolen from, I mean, the reference points were things like Bugs Bunny cartoons and Three Stooges, you know, all the stuff, frankly, that Bruce and I both saw on television when we were kids. Um, and if you listen to the scoring, which Alf Clausen did, a lot of it was patterned after the way that cartoons were scored. And the way the dialogue was laid out was the same thing. What, what, what do you mean? What's up? Uh, it was also a, a pace to it. And this, the door slamming comes more from, when I was in college, I was, I, I was, I was in the drama department, I did theater. Um, I couldn't afford to go to a film school. And I, if I had been able to afford to go to a film school, I couldn't have afforded to make a film. Back then it wasn't like it is now where if you have a phone, you can make a film. Um, so I went and did theater. And, um, you know, when you look at the restoration comedy, there's a lot of door slamming. There's a lot of uh, that kind of stuff. Um, and it, it works, it just does. Um, and it, as I've off, often told people, a lot of the inspiration for, for the show was, um, I saw Tammy of the Shrew. Um, and which is a big body comedy and thought, wow, is, I wonder if there's a way to contemporize that, you know? So it's a combination of all those things, but they were always in the script. Um, we, didn't, we didn't really do ad-libbing. I mean, once in a great while, somebody 
somebody would come up with something. But the, the actors made their contributions in other ways. And obviously those contributions were incredibly uh, valuable. Um, the other truth of it was, and everybody knows this and it's not something I'm proud of, um, but they would get the pages very, very late. So the task yeah. became sort of being dutiful to the pages. I mean, there are yeah. two kinds of ways you can deal with that. When you get pages late as an actor, you can either go, okay, I've really got to surrender to this and, and learn it and understand it and try and discover where the, the, the heart of it is, or I'll get the essence of it and I'll ad lib it. And very early on, everybody recognized that that wasn't going to work, that it was very particular. Um, so people were very doctrinaire about, I mean, script supervisors and people were, you know, made sure that it was done. And also the scenes, <clears throat> I'm sure that people find most memorable, frankly, are the scenes between Bruce and Sybil. And those scenes are duets and they're, done at an extraordinarily fast clip. So the only way to do them right is for everybody to be precise and to learn exactly what they have to do. Now, the, the other part of that, and um, again, feel free to cut any of this out because I think I'm getting into minutia here, is if you look at the way the show was shot, the show was shot to accommodate that. Back then, there was a way the TV shows were shot and, and almost every show was shot the same way. They do a wide shot and then they do a medium shot and then they do close-ups over the shoulder of everybody. And what we very much encouraged all the directors to do was to shoot a great master. Don't worry about getting all that coverage, but if you can shoot a master where almost everything plays, that would be a great thing. So instead of doing three takes of a, a wide shot, and then three takes or two takes of it. I'd say do nine takes of a master if you have to mm -hmm. and get it just the way you want it. And then if we don't have all the other stuff, I'm fine. Because frankly, every time you cut, every time you make a cut, psychologically, you have to re-engage the audience. It's always so much better if you can move and, and stay with those characters. And so uh, the whole show was sort of set up to, to service that idea, you know, uh, and it involved a lot of precision. Um, precision in terms of how the dialogue worked, how the actors treated the dialogue, how the director staged and photographed scenes, how the DP lit those scenes. Um, it, you know, it was all very, very particular. And back then, that was very unusual on television. Back then, most television had a sameness to it. So the idea that, the, you know, we would stake out all these sort of peculiar things. shot and directed a certain way, not coincidentally by Robert Butler, who <clears throat> directed the pilot of Moonlighting. Um, Michael Mann, I want to say maybe a year before us, uh, premiered Miami Vice, which also had an extraordinarily distinctive look and feel to it. But it was still a very new idea. It just wasn't done on television. Um, at, particularly at ABC, almost every show that was on the air that wasn't a half hour comedy was an Aaron Spelling show. And they all looked, they had a very similar look. It was very high gloss, fairly artificial sort of look. Um, and the acting style was very sort of verbose and the casting style was very glamorous. And uh, so much so that, it, you know, and people have heard this story many times, I won't bore you with it. It was very hard to get the job, to get Bruce the job. Because the people yeah. at ABC, well, he doesn't look like the kind mm -hmm. of person we put on television. Um, it wasn't your so, typical yeah. leading man. Yeah. Um, hang on, it's another oh, podcast. Yeah. I'll get ready. <laughs> Hello. Like you mentioned, the Stooges references. Yes. And there's a, a, a lot of them, and they come from Bruce and Sybil. And I know that was a big inspiration for Bruce. But you know, would that be something that they might add in as they go? You know, the sound effects, the um, 
the movements. Oh, yeah, 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 I yeah, think that. yeah. Bruce would once in a while throw one of those. No? Yeah, I think yeah. he did. Sybil would too. Yes, I, yeah, Sybil does it quite a bit too. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. I, you know, one, yeah, once in a while, absolutely. Yeah. Now. Yeah. They would do that. Um, they come up with a, you know, a piece of business or something. Um, but I was on the set quite a bit. And it, it, in fact, I was almost always there when we do a blocking rehearsal before we shoot a scene. So yeah. there was a lot of, you know, we were, we were able to, everybody was able to talk about their ideas, but the ideas were always in service of what had been written. Uh, yeah. Partly because they didn't know where anything was going. Right, yeah. Uh, you know, which made it, you know, a little more challenging. I mean, it's interesting, a lot of movies are written that way. Uh, not, not for any other reason than they have to be. I mean, um, although I'd once read that, for instance, Woody Allen only gives the actors the scenes they need to get the day's work done because he believes that life, that's how life unfolds for us. We don't know what tomorrow's gonna bring, and et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. I think Kubrick did some of that, um, again, to try and make things as real as possible. I've always been fascinated by the story that, um, and he was a hero of mine, Billy Wilder, uh, when he was shooting something like a hot, didn't have an ending. Um, mm -hmm. They really only came up with the ending as they approached the end. They were writing it as they were shooting it. Um, so it's, it, you know, it's, I know some people, uh, it, it's hard. It's really, particularly hard for the actors. Um, but it also brings a kind of energy to the work that um, otherwise doesn't always get there. By the way, I'm a, also a big fan of having a script and shooting it. <laughs> I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to suggest that it's the only way I know how to work. But yeah. certainly on Moonlighting, where I had never really done a television show. I mean, I, I, I was on Remington Steel, but I, I wasn't the, the showrunner, um, and I was on Breaking Away, but I wasn't the showrunner. Uh, and, and Moonlighting wasn't done by a studio. So there was no infrastructure above me to say, here's how we do it. We were to a larger extent than I think people realize really making things up and trying to figure out how to do things. Um, right. So you yeah. say that um, all, all the scripts were supervised by you. They actually went through you. Yeah. Um, so how did it has how does a typical script begin i mean how do you deal with the tyranny of the blank page you know and the second um, question in this this is a two-part question sure. um how did you decide like as far as the writing credits for the show wow okay um <laughs> let, let me take the first part first which is this was back before I had ever heard of something called a writer's room. I mean, we didn't, we didn't have that thing. We did have a conference room, but we didn't spend the day in it or anything. And we, we'd sort of gather for lunch or we'd gather at the beginning of the day and we'd talk. And we'd share the thoughts that we had or things that were percolating in our brains. I remember having a conversation. I was always fascinated with the business of faith and the role of faith um, in this world that we had built. Um, and it was, it grew out of that conversation with the other writers. I remember we were talking about it and I, and I don't remember who said what, I think I said it, but I said, you know, my reflexive instinct is to say that, well, Maddie must be fairly religious in the, in the way that we, we typically think of religion. Um, I mean, she may not go to church every Sunday, but she believes in a higher power and a certain amount of dogma, et cetera, et cetera. Whereas Bruce, Bruce's character, David Addison, clearly is an anarchist and doesn't believe in anything, holds nothing sacred. Right. And I was saying to everybody, the more I thought about it, though, the more I realized it was really kind of the opposite. Mm -hmm. That the, the, the peculiar truth must be that, that, that Maddie, because she's, she's, 
she's a little cooler and colder and more analytical. She may have eschewed the idea of religion a long time ago. Whereas David, who, yes, he's an anarchist, but at the end of the day, he's a romantic. Yeah. And if he knew that Maddie was in fact an atheist, he would fear for her mortal soul. <laughs> and then you go, okay, so how do you, now we're doing this funny show for an hour on ABC. How do you have that? What do you do with that? And I, I can't remember where the, the next piece was that we, we either collectively or whatever made the leap that sort of the dramatic presentation of faith is magic. Why do we go see magicians? Why are we fascinated by magicians? Because they do these things that seem to say there are powers greater than all of us. You've just seen something that your, your analytical mind tells you you can't believe. And yet there it was, you saw it. Blah, 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 blah. So if you remember, we did this show about a magician and a, boy, it's been so long. Uh, I want to say he has an assistant who drowns in a town. I don't remember. But I, I, what I do remember is why the show existed, the episode existed philosophically. And it was to reveal this idea that Maddie was dubious about religion. And David, although probably hadn't walked into a church in five years, still had a very strong sense spiritual you know a spiritual sense that there was something greater and yeah. he also is capable of revealing his love for maddie through his concern for her i remember at one point he, he has this whole rap about don't you know she, she says you know I, you know I don't, I don't really believe in god he says, don't say that don't say that cover your options you know <laughs> <This is> all... <laughs> yeah. um yeah. But that's how a show would start to take shape. It would usually start from a, a philosophical idea. Hey, well, how do, we, how do we explore that? Sometimes it came from someplace else. I, very early on, I want to say maybe the second or third show, one of the shows you've already talked about. It's called The Next, not The Next Voice You Hear, but The Next, the next Murder You Hear. The Next Murder You Hear. Um, the writer of that show, I want to say he may have pitched the, the general architecture of it. Um, and remember, we were very early on in the show. We weren't completely sure what the show was. We were still trying to figure that out. But he took it home. Boy, I hope I got these names right. And it turned out he was living with Melinda, I want to say it was Melinda Dillon, who's a wonderful actress, who I want to say played the mother in Close Encounters of the Third Kind, you know, mother with the little boy, you know. Yeah. And I want to say she wrote this fantastic monologue that the radio announcer does at the beginning of the episode, where he talks about yeah. beating hearts. He's like a late night DJ. Yeah. And I found that very inspirational. And the episode, a lot of the episode sort of grew out of that. It was like, ooh, she set the bar, bar very high here. So, and by the way, she's not credited on the show at all. Um, and I may be, the problem with these recollections are, of course, I'm not certain of the accuracy. So big asterisk, I apologize to anyone that I'm, um, if it's not Melinda Dillon, I, I'm so sorry. Um, uh, and the episodes sort of grow. Um, they, they all sort of have a life of their own. I mean, famously, everybody knows the Shakespeare episode. Again, I, I had been obsessed forever with uh, Taming of the Shrew as being sort of the genesis of the spirit of the show. And I think Jeff and Ron came in and said, let's just do a whole show on Iambic Pentameter. And then I shared my passion for Tim and the Shrew. They went back and crafted that whole episode. I mean, it, it's probably 
the episode I did the least amount of work on script wise. I, I did do something to the ending because the ending was, and this was decades before me too, but the, the ending was so, to my mind, misogynistic. And I felt, you know, off key in that way. Um, but, but it was a great script. And like the best Moonlighting scripts, audacious. Um, I, yeah. think, I think Deborah and Carl, they came in with something about old movies. They had this whole old movie idea in their head. And then I got very excited because all of a sudden I was like, we're going to shoot in black and white. <laughs> oh man, what, a, <laughs> what an adventure that was. And then, but, and I don't remember how the two dreams of it all came up. They may have had that. And then I remember I extrapolated that out into, we'll shoot half of it in sort of the Warner Brothers black and white and half of it in the MGM sort of high gloss black and white. But everybody would sort of, it was done communal, you know, once it was out there, the conversation about it was communal. Right. Everybody talk about it. And then the writers would invariably go off and write it. And then they'd hand it in. And then I'd kind of give it a pass to my typewriter to try and make it sound like Bruce and Sybil. I mean, that was, that was really the reason it would go through my typewriter. Um, and also because Jay Daniel and I had a very simpatico relationship. He was the line producer, the physical producer, and in many ways had the hardest job of all because he would get all these ideas very, very, very late. And then he had to make them sort of happen in reality. Um, yeah. So, it was it was very much a group effort um and it was a great group you know i mean i don't know if you guys watch the morning show on apple um that's carrie aaron yeah. who was with aaron, us yeah. um yeah. i mean it's just, yeah. it was just a phenomenal group of people and we were very yeah. very lucky very blessed um you know blessed obviously on the actor side with bruce sybil elise beasley uh curtis armstrong and blessed on the on the writing side and on the directing side. Peter Werner probably directed the best episodes in those first couple of years. Um, and, and that was no accident. He understood the show in a way that um, Alan Arkish too. I mean, there were just certain people who, who got it, um, yeah. you know. Um, and, and you can was, tell because they're one of the best, they're the best episodes. Yes, yes. And, and uh, I think when they get it. Yeah. And you got to remember early on, people weren't clamoring to do the show. They didn't know what the show was. Mm, so yeah. some of it was the luck of the draw because you'd get directors who were like, all I know is I have to be done with this in seven days. And I would say to them, no, you don't. <laughs> you <laughs> yeah. need to be good. <laughs> And yeah. they would just look at me like I was out of my mind because no one else operated that way. So it was, it was it it took a little bit to find people who who sort of understood the ethos of the whole thing. I figured I had nothing to lose. You know, part of it was it was was that you know that arrogance and stupidity of youth. Um, so I'd be standing with a forty year old man who had spent the last fifteen years of his life trying to build a directing career career, and this kid was standing going, no. No, no, do it again. No, you know. Yeah. In hindsight, I look back and I completely understand how absurd it must have seemed, and how, again, arrogant it must have seemed. Um, but, but here we are, thirty years later, and we're still talking about it. So maybe, maybe you know, it wasn't so crazy. But um, yeah, exactly. Um, so uh, let me ask you about the Maddie character because um, sure. I think. I've heard you talk about, you know, the David Addison character and how he was kind of a reaction to men that you saw on television um, that, you know, those aren't, weren't the men that you knew in real life and you wanted to kind of, um, you know, put something on screen that was more relevant to you. Uh, but so the Maddie character, um, 
what yeah where where did she come from or uh, was she a reflection of women that you knew um or you know or was she more of a fantasy um you know one thing i'd say about her you know when we look back on these shows you know um you know not, not that you can um look back through the lens of today but uh she was such a kind of um violent person you know and um, when we look at the episodes, and, and I've talked about that, and, and some um, other listeners have written and said, at first I was really defensive of you saying that Maddie was really violent, but when you look at it, she was, you know, because she was always hitting him and kicking him, slapping him and shoving him around and, you know, um, yeah, just a, just a lot of like physical, you know, stuff with her. But um, yeah, anyway, so I'd love to know, you know, more about I, I, the Yes, and it's you know it's hard because the lens is so different um, today, say than it was yeah. then. Um, the the irony is, I always thought she was a very strong character. Um, yeah, and, she is. Um, um, there is, but even that, I mean, she was different. Her. There's a physicality to her, and it's interesting when you reference. And you didn't reference it, I did, but but when one references Taming the Shrew, yeah, that character, Kate, is a very physical character. Yeah. And I think more to the point, there's a I don't think you feel like anyone's in any mortal danger with her when you say she's violent. It's 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 from yeah. that sort of school of, you know, I've got to even this up somehow. Um mm -hmm. We just enjoy the physical, her physical, both of their physical comedy. Yeah. And you've got to have that. Yeah. It comes it's, from that, you know, that school of, of, you know, theater, I guess, or drama or something. But, uh, I, you know, I would never describe her as violent. But, I, you know, I can see where, you know, um, you know, more to the point of answering your question. Um, yeah. I can all you know, you can only guess at these things because it isn't like when you sit down and create these characters, you go, where am I going to get this character from? The characters start to start to appear, and then they sort of channel themselves through you, and you don't really understand. You make up mumbo jumbo to say to people, I mean, should you ever be asked to speak at a podcast? But 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 you don't actually understand. Um <laughs> So, and that's why you say things like moonlighting in a hallway to an executive on the other end of the hall. Um, yeah. I think Maddie came from a couple of places. I think she, first of all, my mom was a very, and I mean this in the best way. She was, uh, my, my, my parents were divorced. And so she brought me up, uh, and, and it was at a time when divorce was still very much a stigma. Um, and she didn't care. She went out and she earned a living. And um, uh, when, when my dad left uh, and they went to court, uh, she said, I don't want anything from him. It's a point of pride. Um, she was a very strong, person. Uh, and I mean that in the best of ways, because sometimes that can be turned into a, you know, a, a coded, um, uh, not nice thing to say, particularly mm -hmm. when it's when it's referenced uh, at a woman. Oh, it's very strong. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of winking going on. That, that's not mm -hmm. what I'm trying to suggest here. Um, yeah. So that I, I think that was part of it. I think part of it was I used to love. Um, I was talking about Frank Capra earlier. If you, if you go back and look at his films, the women were always extraordinary, extraordinarily strong. Barbara Stanwyck and these they planted their feet and they weren't going to let some guy push them around. And their destiny wasn't tied to some guy. Um, I will make my own destiny was sort of their North Star. And to me, that's who Maddie was. Now, I was also a 20 something year old kid. Ooh. So my worldview, frankly, was fairly limited. Um, you know, I, I'd met women, but 
I certainly hadn't met lots of women. And um, so I was in many cases guessing. Um, and I think there was a certain amount of um, fantasy or wish fulfillment in that. Um, yeah. You know, you always want the person who won't have you, you know, that paradigm. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I think in Maddie and David, you had that. You know, he was, why was he so smitten with it? Well, she was beautiful and then this and that. And all that. But mostly, I think it was because she just couldn't abide him. You know, oh yeah, we'll see about that. You know, and <laughs> it was that. Yeah, um, yeah. Sure. So, so she was kind of, and she was smart. And she yeah. was, she, like I say, she, she, she was the captain of her own ship. You know, she went in there that day in the pilot to close that place up, mm. you know? Yeah. And, and for him, it was yeah. an act of desperation. I've got to change her mind because I don't know what to do with my life if I don't. Um, yeah. So. Oh, I mean, I think she's uh, she was ahead of her time. I mean, she's definitely a woman, a very strong woman, business minded. Um, not driven by relationship or family, you know, to, she's not driven to just go and get married and have a family and things like that. You know, I mean, yeah, I think, I think she's a great representation of um, a female on TV. You know, I think she was ahead of her time. I mean, I think so yeah, too. I don't, I, yeah. A lot of the conversations I would have with Sybil at the time were, I think she was concerned that she, And I don't want to put words in her mouth, but I think she was concerned that that she wasn't painting a, a picture of a woman who uh, was, you know, she, she wanted to be something that people, she wanted to play something that people would admire, play mm -hmm. someone that people would admire. And I kept saying, I, I think you're missing the big picture because the big picture is, look at the men, the men are, doofuses. I mean, the man she goes out with in the pilot, the guy with the lobster bib. I mean, True, that guy yeah. a, a jerk. I mean, he's a plastic surgeon. He obviously does very well, but, right. you know, he's, his left lobe is gone. I mean, there's no, nothing going on up there. Um, and then you have David, who's charming as hell and fascinating and interesting yeah. and all of that. But, you know, also, you know, um, you know, not the most ambitious guy in the world. You know, he's trying to figure out how to live his life through the least amount of effort possible. So you, when you say, okay, who's the, who's the moving force in this thing? It's Maddie Hayes. It's not, it's not David Addison. Dave, everything David does is self-serving. Mm -hmm. um, and and it, he's chasing her. It, it, yeah, it was hard to see that, I think, for a long time. Um, it's, and, and stop me again if you've heard all this. You know, when the show first premiered, there was a, a reviewer here in Los Angeles. Um, boy, his name escapes me, but he was really important. I mean, his stuff would be on the front page of what they call the calendar section every day. And the show premiered and he wrote a review and it said, Beauty and the Beast. Mm -hmm. that, was the, that was the headline. And he was saying, you know, what an awful show it was. And one of the things that made it particularly awful was this Bruce Willis person, because he's not a leading man, and blah, 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 blah. And these people are, he just went on and on and on and hated the show. And then about four weeks later, he wrote another review. And the review was, okay, I admit it, I didn't get it. Now I get it. Yeah. And I think the show had that effect, not only on the people who watched it, but on the people who were in it. I mean, Bruce got it right away. You know, we were virtually the same age. We came from very similar backgrounds. Sybil was this huge movie star who'd had, you know, tremendous success, um, you know, ha had a big career, lost a big career. You know, she'd been through a lot of stuff. Bruce and I were two guys in on a day pass, you know, who'd sort of snuck in, you know? I mean, it was, so it, it took, it took, a, and most of the people we were working with on the crew were people who'd been doing this for 20 or 30 years. And they looked at me like I was out of my mind. So it, it took everybody a while 
to get it. And I think to this day, some people don't get it. I think they feel that, that you know, as a female character, there's maybe a lot uh, missing there. And they may be right. You, you can't do everything right. Um, but I, I was always quite fond of her. Mm -hmm. um, she always stood her ground. She always knew what she wanted. She was never shy about saying how she felt. Um, and she made him a better man. Yeah. I think in many ways he made her a better woman. You know, he mm -hmm. dared her to live her life in a more yeah. exciting way. And it's, you know? it's great. You, I mean, I admire you for having the vision and sticking with it and going to the network and saying, no, this is how it has to be. You know, if you, if you glean nothing else from this interview. Okay. Glean this. I had no vision. <laughs> yes, and, you did. Uh, yes, you did. You had a vision. You know, no, I, I mean, I obviously I'm, I'm being, my tongue is firmly in my cheek, but I mean, <laughs> people, people say that to me a lot, you know, and, and it was less about courage than it was again about youth. And, um, you know, you have this moxie when you're young, again, because you don't, you've never, I've, I've never been here before. I didn't grow up here. I wasn't, didn't know anybody in the movie or TV business. Um, I desperately wanted to be in it, but I also had nothing to lose. Um, the most exactly. I ever made in my life was $150 a week. I was, you know, you know, so it was easy for me to say, no, it has to be this way. Nobody can take anything away from me. I didn't have anything. <laughs> yeah, because I think you've said, I don't know whether it was in the commentary or one of your interviews that um, you, you actually created something that you thought would amuse you. Yes, that was very much. And I really believed that because I believed if it amused me, it might amuse someone else. And there was so much television that I looked at that I was dumbfounded by. It's just, I look at it and I go, who is this for? And the one thing that was crystal clear for me is it wasn't for the people who had made it. They felt it was their job to make it for someone else, someone that they'd never met, but that they'd heard about who maybe lived between New York and LA. And I always found that really patronizing um, and ill-advised. Um, so I, I, I really thought I'm only going to be here for a little while and I'm going to burn the place down if I have to. I just <laughs> really want, these are all things I want. And I had like this list of things in my head that I wanted to do. And some of them I didn't get to do. We never got to do the 3D episode. We fooled yeah. around with it, but never got it done. I always wanted to have Bruce Light a match on the edge <laughs> of the frame. You know, just reach out to where your TV set is and light a match. You know, it, it just had a yeah. bunch of... And some of them I didn't get to. Um, and so other people had to. the Anselmo case, for instance, which was, I, I think was Roger Directors. That was the thing mm -hmm. he came up with. Um, obviously, we never quite crescendoed on that. There's other stuff. But, but what a great gift to be able to go and play like that for three years. Fantastic. And, you know, and we did. We played to our heart's content. I mean, nobody from the network really weighed in with notes or... I mean, they yelled at us a lot about how long we were taking and the money we were spending, but they certainly never said no. You, I mean, in the beginning they did. And I would say no, or, or, or worse still, I'd say yes, and then not do it. Um, <laughs> um, and I mean, that That's started the with the pilot. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the pilot was like, don't let them get romantically involved. Nobody would ever believe her with him. And I went, okay, no problem. Ooh, and, nice. you know, <laughs> <laughs> and of course we did yeah. it. And, then, you know, I remember when we did the... Um, the mole on his nose. <laughs> they called me and yeah. went, what are you doing? What are you yeah. doing? We're looking for a man with a mole on his nose. Mole on his nose? A mole on his nose. What kind of clothes? What kind of clothes? What kind of clothes do you suppose? What kind of clothes do I suppose would be worn by a man with a mole on his nose? Who knows? Did I happen to mention that I bothered to disclose this man that we're seeking with a mole on his nose? I'm not sure of his clothes or anything else, except he's Chinese. A big clue by itself. How do you do that? You gotta read a lot of Dr. Seuss. I'm sorry to say, I'm sad to report, I haven't seen anyone at all of that sort. Not a man who's Chinese with a mole on his nose with some kind of clothes that you can't suppose. So, get away from this door and get out of this place or I'll have to hurt you. Put my foot in your face. Oh. Time to go. Time to go. And I said, don't you think it's funny? And they went, you can't do that. They won't take him seriously as a private investigator. I said, 
no, no one, no one takes him seriously as a private investigator. No, no, so no one takes. It's not about him that. It's not about that. Yeah, no, not, not about. The other one was when he put the, the, the safety pin in. Put the safety. You put the safety pin in. You put the safety pin out. That whole thing. They called me and said, "You can't do that." <laughs> Chair, play a dirty trick with it's guaranteed not to rust, bust, break, bend, and we'll cut a cow in half. I've always been curious about this. Listen to it. You stick the stick pin in. Pull the stick pin out. You stick the stick pin in, and you shake it all about. You do the hokey pokey, and you turn yourself about. That's what it's all about. So funny. Oh, can I just say, when we interviewed Scott Ryan, you've got to listen to the interview because he he solved the Insolmo case. Oh, okay. Yeah, so you'll have to listen to that. Okay, I promise. <laughs> um, can I just go back to the um, casting of Bruce? Obviously, sure. it's well known that there were thousands um, um, that auditioned for the part. But, you know, you always say in, in your interviews, you know, you knew, oh, that's the guy. That's the guy. Oh, yeah. yeah. Right? Absolutely. I but, brought him back. Yeah, that's right. So what were those, what were the qualities? What did you see in him that was perfect to be David Addison? Um, he had this kind of, he had two things, he had a bunch of things. First of all, we saw, not me, but I mean, the production saw, I was told Ruben Cannon did the casting. And at one point he told me that through his various casting agents in different parts of the country and in Canada, they had looked at 3000 men, just to give you an idea of the scope of the thing. And then, I, I don't know if I told this to Scott or not, I can't remember, but at one point, literally ABC came and said, okay, we're, we're just going to pay you off because we believe the part's uncastable. They actually said, Bill Murray has a movie crew. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> right. But it, it, what we were looking for were two things. One was you had to be really good with language because the part was was all about language. There's just tons of language. And so you had to be able to come in. And as I said, Bruce immediately understood that it was musical, that there was a cadence to it. And, a, and that's because he's, he's musical. And I could write a three page monologue for him and often did at yes. 630 in the morning, he'd come into work at seven and by 745, he'd have it word perfect. Wow. Because it was musical and he was young and you know, there's, you know, it was, but there were, of all the guys that we auditioned, there were maybe three who could handle that part of it. Yeah. You know, you could actually just handle the language. My other job, hang on a second. <laughs> oh, so there were, and one of them interestingly was Dennis Dugan, uh, who went on to play <laughs> Walter Bishop. But Dennis did a fan, on a purely technical level, Dennis did a fantastic um, audition. Um, and I mean, we saw, I remember Bill Maher came in, um, a lot of people who went on. Adam, Adam Arkin? Did you have Adam Arkin? Adam came in and did a wonderful audition. Um, but the thing that made Bruce different for me was he did a couple of things. He also had this sort of unbridled sexuality. He just was a guy <laughs> he's a guy's guy unapologetically yeah unapologetically a guy which was when i talked about the fact that there was nobody on television that i understood or related to that was really what i was talking about it was a period when the men on television took great pride in how sensitive they were i remember and i mean no, no disrespect to him he's a great actor and great director and a great writer, but Alan Alda was probably the, the most loved man on television at that point. And, and he projected this sort of very sincere and earnest. And I just had never met anyone. I grew up on Long Island, you know, and everybody, you know, <laughs> I would see a laundry truck going by and I think that's probably what I'm gonna end up doing, in, in, you know, in my life. <laughs> um, I, the life I knew was a little more hard scrabble than the one that was on TV. And 
I wanted someone who reflected more of that. And the way I saw men and women comport themselves wasn't what I saw on TV, you know, which at that time was things like the love boat and the, all the other things that were like the love boat. I can't remember their names. Um, yeah. But Bruce, and Bruce seemed, <clears throat> he was like a guy I knew. I mean, I instantly knew him. I'd, and I would go on when I started to direct movies, I'd have that experience with other act. I mean, Michael Keaton and I, boom, it, it, it was like instant. Um, Richard yeah. Dreyfuss, um, there were just certain people that you, you have a commonality and you go, okay. Yeah, it just clicks. Yeah, what was fascinating was at the network level, they didn't see it at all. They just thought he looks like a criminal. He looks like a, uh, maybe a guest star or a character actor or, but I would walk him down the halls and the secretaries would throw themselves over their desks. I mean, it was just, I mean, and I know it sounds like I'm exaggerating, but I remember we went to lunch once on Pico Boulevard, which is a not terribly fancy street here in LA. And as we were walking down the street, girls were going crazy and he wasn't on television. Yeah. Um, yeah. But he was outrageous. We, so we, in fact, we went out to lunch, we were sitting in this restaurant. <laughs> and I, at some point, I guess a waiter came out, we didn't see this, we heard it, a waiter came out and, and dropped a tray of dishes, you know, crash. And literally without any thinking, he stood up and he went, and stay out. And sat back down and continued his lunch. I, I you know, yeah. there was nobody like yeah. that on television at that time. No. Um, so I knew. Now, having said that, I before I knew there was a Bruce Willis, before I met him, there were other people I thought, well, this person might be able to do it. That person might. Be. I mean, originally I thought there was a very, very, very um, successful radio guy out here named Rick Dees, and I'd mentioned him to the network and don't know that I mentioned anyone, but once I met Bruce, he was the only one. And so I brought him back numerous times. He was turned down numerous times. Um, it was a real odyssey. Um, but ultimately he got the part and hey, well, you know, it worked out. Um, <laughs> yeah, sure did. Sure did. Um, so let's see. What I would love to um, ask you about next is um, as the creator of the show, um, you know, I think one, one of the reasons, um, in my view, that we're still talking about it all these years later is, of course, the relationship between Maddie and David. Mm -hmm. And maybe because of the fact that they didn't end up together in the end um, is one of the reasons, you know, as you know, the fans are always so heartbroken about the, um, some of the things that happened, you know, between those characters and that they didn't end up together. Um, but so as the creator, Did you envision them ultimately ending up together? Because um, there are many points in the show where uh, I think the, the fans were promised that they would end up together because in alternate universes, they're together, you know, in the, a womb with a view, the, the angel, you know, tells the baby that they've been doing this for centuries, you know, for um, many other lifetimes, you know, they always end up together, basically. So, um, you know, I guess, yeah, first part of the question is, you know, did you envision, I know you had nothing to do at the very end of the show. You weren't there for that. Um, did you envision them ultimately, you know, ending up together? Um, I guess I'll, I'll ask you that first. And then, yeah, I wanted to ask you something about- It's a great question. Um, it's a great question. <laughs> I think I did. I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm qualifying it by saying, I think because I don't think I thought it through. I think I just assumed they would. Why would you present this great romance and have it end on the other way? Um, but of course, so many things happen that no one could anticipate. Um, you know, Sybil yeah. got pregnant, which she yeah, obviously a blessed thing and all that, yeah. but, uh, but a complicated thing for us to figure out. Um, there was a writer's, really protracted writer's strike. Um, Bruce broke his shoulder, and then he had the audacity to become a huge international movie star. I mean, you know, just a bunch of things that would have been impossible 
to anticipate. And then because we were in the television business where you're supposed to be on every week, you sort of have to yeah. play the cards you, you're dealt. And that was really the first time we had to do that on that show. Prior to that, we, we played the cards we wanted to play. Um, yeah. And then, of course, at a point I was told to leave, so I left. Um, and it was more like a season and a half, I think. Um, yeah. Here's what I will tell you. And I've said it before, it's, it's, it's not earth shaking, but because a lot of people think, you know, they talk about the moonlighting curse and people should never get together because it changes everything, blah, blah, blah. I don't subscribe to that theory at all. Um, I believe that absolutely could have worked. I wouldn't have done it if I didn't think so. I just, frankly, never got a chance to do what I wanted to do. Um, uh, I'm not complaining and I'm not crying. I I've had a, a wonderful <laughs> uh, wow. life and show, so is the show, but, but um, I wouldn't have done that if I thought it was absolutely gonna tank the show. Um, I think if we could have had them together, things would have been much different, but they weren't physically able to be together. And um, as extraordinary a power as I am, even <laughs> I, could, and I, God knows I tried. I mean, I got Will Vinton to make a claymation sibyl, for God's sake. I'll show you I how desperate I was. In fact, where do you get off even asking if we, wait a minute, you're putting words in my mouth. You're turning me into Addison. I'm a witch. The broom fits. I love the frog too. It's hilarious. The best. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm yeah. just saying, you know, so, I, you know, we'll, we'll never know. Maybe, I know. Maybe we'll know. You never know. But uh, <laughs> okay. In, okay. The, in the near term, uh, the nearest mm -hmm. term, we'll never know. And, um, and I, I do feel bad about that. I feel bad if anyone was let down, but, um, you know, it, it is what it is. Yeah. I would say, um, as a viewer, because I, I remember specifically, I think, you know, I was 16 or 17 years old when um, I think season four was airing. I was very much invested in the show. <laughs> um, so after Sybil came back from uh, the, the pregnancy and all that stuff, and um, uh, mid, mid, like mid um, season four towards the end, when she came back and they were finally in the same room together, it was... Um, at the very end of the episode, and I remember I was looking, oh, we have eight minutes left. And now we're there. She's just coming into the office because the rest of it had been dream sequences and stuff for in um, Tracks of My Tears and her meeting Walter on the train and all that stuff. Um, and then it was, um, I'm married and the baby's not yours. <laughs> that, to me, as a viewer, that, that was the insurmountable thing because you can't, you know, David Addison is um, a, such a strong man and, you know, a character that's not going to be played the fool, you know? So I, to me, those were two things that were just so difficult, you know, to get, to come back from if you were ever going to, you know, ask for them to end up together. Well, um, I don't have a vivid memory. I mean, it's a long time ago. And I, I, I was certainly involved in the choice, the Walter Bishop choice. And in fact, I thought, oh, we'll get Dennis. I mean, I needed a male for her to play with. And my recollection is we had so forced, we needed to shoot somebody. She wasn't available, so we shot Bruce. Now Bruce had to go make the movie that they'd been delaying. So we had civil back. So we didn't have those two people, which is, of course, what everybody yeah. wanted. So yeah. we came, dreamt up this, I uh, is probably mostly me, dreamt up this Walter Bishop thing. Um, and to me, he was the, what I was imagining was he was that guy who's in all those 40s movies who's, who you look at and you go, why is she with him? He's boring. She should be with, yeah. you know, Cary Grant or this one or that one, but but they always have that guy, usually played by Tom Ewell or somebody like that. <laughs> and um, the fan reaction was so strong and so swift. And of course it was before the internet. So it meant that people picked up their phones or wrote a letter. Yeah. And that I remember going to Dennis and saying, okay, my bad, this isn't gonna work. 
<laughs> but I tried to give him a great exit, you know, which is he literally turns to the camera and goes, you happy? And he leaves. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. And then, of course, we said to him, he, he came to me and he said, I'd love to direct. Yeah. And it seemed like an inspired idea because he, he and Sybil ha had a real chemistry and he also got along really well with Bruce. Um, yeah. But this was right around the time, too, that I was sort of being uninvited from the show. So it, it, yeah. it, my memory is foggy in terms of everything that sort of happened after that. And then yeah. on that year and a half that I wasn't there, I didn't watch much of it. It was painful. Mm. Yeah, I yeah, watched, yeah, it would have been. I watched, obviously I watched Womb With You because Bruce called me and Chick Egley called me and said, will you do this? And I was like, okay. Um, so I did it. And I may have watched the last episode just out of the sense of, you know, masochistic curiosity. Yeah. Um, did you yeah, did you call Walter Bishop Walter as a, you know, homage to Bruce because that's his real name, or did it just? I think it might it might have come from there. Yeah, I don't remember. I don't remember well enough to tell you absolutely, <laughs> but yes, yeah, I'm aware that his real name is Walter, and yeah, kind of build that in. Well, it, yeah, a lot of it was painful. Um, season five to watch with uh, without your hand <laughs> in it, you know. It, they, yeah, they tried to kind of, yeah. And I, some of that also may be, um, it's hard to know. I mean, every show I've done since then, frankly, I've done in the same way, which is to say, almost all the scripts go through my typewriter. It's the same process, which is a difficult process for a lot of people. Um, I'm not the only one who does it. A lot of people do it. Um, but over the years, I've had to ask myself the question, are you doing that because it authentically makes the show better? Or are you doing that because you have some need to do that that doesn't have anything to do with the show? Um, I always end up on the side of, no, I believe this is genuinely making the show better and, and markedly making the show better. I don't take credit for the work that I do. I don't put my name on those scripts. I don't, um, so it's not about that. Um, but I, uh, but it's always really painful then to look at the episodes that I haven't been able to work on because I feel as if the actors are being asked to do things that they might otherwise not be asked to do. You know, the, the directors are making choices that aren't informed by the presence of someone who's been there from the very beginning and can say, no, no, this is this and this is that, blah, 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 blah. blah. Yeah. Um, so it's it's just it's just you know that part of it is 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 difficult. Yeah. Yeah. I think you had a very having clear vision. That, of the show. Yeah. Having said that. Yeah. One of the first movies that Bruce did was um, Blind Date. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It was directed by Blake Edwards, who is a master mm -hmm. of physical comedy. And he, Bruce said to me, he said, come to the set, come to the set, come watch, it'll be fun, it'll be great. So I went to watch him on the set and there was Blake Edwards, a master. And here was I, a guy who'd been making television at that point for maybe a year, I, my mm -hmm. own show anyway. I'd been in television a little longer than that, but for maybe a year, and I couldn't watch. Mm. Yeah. I thought, he, I thought he was doing everything wrong. So, you know, which is obviously absurd, but I mention that because it's, it's, it, you know, to this day, I mean, these guys are all still my, Roger Director is somebody I adore. Um, Ron and Jeff, people I adore. And, you know, every seven or eight years, somebody says, let's all get together. And so we all get together, you know, we have a drink or whatever. And I have to admit, I haven't seen the last season. Yeah. Which yeah. seems yeah. crazy, but it's yeah. it's like it's like you know the, the the person you date in college and you think, well, this is the person. This is the person. And mm -hmm. then something happens and they're not the person. 
and then you spin into them again and you think, I don't want to relive the three years you weren't the person. I just don't, I, you know, it, you yeah. know, it's so it, it is because it is a bit like a love affair, you know? Yeah, um, sure. It's, um, sure. So something you created and that has a special yeah. place in your, your heart and your mind. So those and choices, I, those yeah. choices that you reference when you ask that question, some of those, a lot of them were mine and a lot of them weren't. And sometimes it's as simple as saying, I mean, with Bruce, sometimes it would be as simple as me saying, <laughs> I don't want to say anything. Uh, I'm trying to figure out a nice way to say this. But, but I, ba I basically say to him, lead with your heart more, not with the other parts of your body that, <laughs> that it, 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 you know. Um, right. And he'd get that. Because sometimes his first instinct particularly back then, was yeah. play something tough. And I would explain to him, you are tough. You don't yeah. have to play that. If you just lead with this other thing, you'll be doing something that almost no one does anymore because you'll get both values. Um, and I like to think saying those things to actors is important. So, you know, again, uh, for the times that I wasn't able to do that, I worry that I, it'd be interesting to know if I, do, am I actually worried that it all went fine without me or and do I worry that, <laughs> that it did? Yeah. But I, there's a lot of shows that I've missed. I, a couple that I've heard are great. You know, uh, Alan Arkish did uh, a pair of shows, uh, Cool Hand Dave, I think, or something toward the end there that I've never seen that I think Roger Director wrote. I and, find it difficult to watch that episode. Oh, do you? Mm. Um, but you know what I mean? It's, it's, it's relative. Everybody's got their own thing. And yeah. um, and a bigger, better man than I would have looked at them. <laughs> so there you go. Can I, I would just... say that. Oh, sorry. I was just going to say, um, I think, you know, Moonlighting fans watch season five because it's, more episodes of the characters that we love and we're looking for something you know an, a, a further evolution of their relationship which is never resolved so it's very frustrating hmm. but like i said you know that could be part of the reason why we're talking about it all all these years later not season five but just that you know the arc was never really finished so it's a bit of a heartache for fans right. you know sure. um yeah i i think it was kind of done um i mean i think the story of maddie and david was finished after and the flesh was made word um, where they kind of agreed to, you know, um, do Lamaze together and things like that. You know, after that, it's not a lot of the same characters that we that we know. I don't think we ever them. got over it, <laughs> to be honest. Yeah. Um, would Moonlighting have been a different show if you had the luxury of time um, instead of like at the moment shows have the luxury of time planning and filming streaming and all this stuff um do you think moonlighting would have been the same show if you had the luxury of time instead of this brevity i think it would have been a different show mm. because a lot of what made it work was the lack of contemplation time and, yeah. and in a strange way it, that frees you someone has a gun to your head so all the crazy ideas that you would otherwise censor yourself or not permit yourself to indulge in, you go, it's the only idea I've got, it's the only one that feels honest to me. So that's what I'm going with. I, I, I always remember Jay Daniel, who again, the show wouldn't have existed without Jay Daniel. Yeah. He came to my door one day and he went, do you have the pages? And I said, no, not yet. Uh, and I always felt terrible. And he said, What's going on? And I go, I said, I'm waiting for the truth. And he said, <laughs> and I said, I'm waiting for the character to do something I believe they'd actually do. And he went, oh. When you do that under the crunch of time, knowing that everybody's waiting, because once you give yourself that pass and you go, well, I got to write something, they got to shoot something because we have to be on television. Mm -hmm. Then 
I think subconsciously, I, this sounds so preposterous. Feel free to roll your eyes, <laughs> not them podcast line. But I think the audience subconsciously goes bullshit. That they 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 watch the show and they it's like when someone's playing the piano. You don't have to know how to play the piano, but when someone else is playing the piano and they hit the wrong note, you hear it, you know it. Yeah. When you're invested in characters in the passionate way that I believed people were invested in Maddie and David, they, they knew it when you were trying to sell them something, which I think is sort of what you're referencing when you talk about those other episodes, um, that doesn't make sense given the DNA of those people. Um, and by the way, that's nobody's fault. Nobody's to be, um, you know, again, I, the people that were there had a, a really difficult job, not just because I wasn't there, but also because everybody's lives had changed. The people that came to that soundstage in the beginning, Bruce, me, Elise, um, like I say, Sybil had already had three or four lives. Um, those people were different three and a half seasons in. A, they were tired. They'd been through a whirlwind. Their lives had become public fodder. Um, and Curtis, I didn't mean to leave Curtis out. Same thing, you know, it, 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 and then when you feel like maybe the, the, the North Star isn't as clear to you, the compass isn't as strong, um, Roger, I think, and Chick, who were really sort of the creative, um, sort of running everything creatively, hadn't developed as much confidence with the actors as obviously as I had. I'd been there from the very beginning and I created it, I picked them. Yeah. So the relationship, their relationship with the actors was different. And so maybe they had to road test their ideas much more. I never had a road test. Like I would go down there and say, this is what we're doing, which is a great freedom. So the shows, I'm trying to say is the shows were harder to make. Yeah. They didn't have right. the luxury of waiting for grand inspiration because now they had the network. And the network wouldn't mess around when I was there because I had fooled them into thinking I knew something. <laughs> but once I was gone, you know, people rushed in and said, okay, here's what we're going to do now. We're going to make it so this is easy and that's easy and people can leave and blah, 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 which is fair. It's absolutely fair. I understood that. I think Sybil in particular was just exhausted with the whole damn thing. It's like, I got to know I can come in at this time and leave at that time and only work. With, and, you know, that's an absolutely yeah. human response. Um, yeah. She had, you know, two more children. She, you know, it's a different yeah. life. Bruce yeah. is a huge movie star and people are going, yeah. let's make this movie. And he's like, I got to shoot this show that nobody gives a shit about anymore. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's, yeah, it's like, go, yeah. go clean me up in the thing. Um, <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> um, no, it's, it's right. It, it's very complicated and, and it's a job no one wants, you know, and, and yeah. um, you know, and I feel badly that it ended that way. I, I look at shows that end You know, with dignity, and and uh, I mean, look at the way Mad Men ended after whatever it was, five or six seasons. It was clear they knew. I don't believe for a minute, by the way, that he knew the ending before he started the show, which he claims. But it's clear he knew what he wanted it to be, and drove the train to get there in a very, very, very specific way. And you, you have to admire that; it's extraordinary. Um, mm -hmm. So how's that long answer to a short question, huh? <laughs> <laughs> right? um, okay, so, wait, I get to ask a question. What's the shirt okay. you have on? It's for oh, the folks who have, are listening to this oh, podcast. We have, we have Moonlighting merchandise. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Moonlighting podcast, podcast merchandise. Oh, look at that. Oh, that's cool. Um, tote bags. That's cool. Uh, is about, and next, guess what? Oh. There's 66 items, just the same as how many episodes there were of Moonlighting. Get out really? of town. <laughs> and, Coincidence? And, and are these on a website or something where people can... can yes. Uh... yes, they're on Redbubble. 
Okay. It's redbubble.com slash people slash moonpod2016. Okay. Yeah. Um, can you shoot me a link? <laughs> of course. I'll email it to you. Okay. Yes. Um, and my next call, you know, is to Disney, um, who will oh, see yeah. it. But um, because they... <laughs> You know, they've, they've made it their goal to make sure no one ever sees Moonlighting again. So I know. Talking. Sorry. That's, <laughs> well, no, sorry. Me, so Shauna and I are absolutely determined to get bring Moonlighting <laughs> back into the 21st century streaming. Okay. I don't care what you say, Disney. We're doing it. Okay. One last um, question. Yeah. Okay. So one last question. Go ahead. Yes. So there is one question that I think many Moonlighting fans have wanted an answer to, okay. and it was since the lady, the lady in the Iron Mask. Okay. Did Dr. Karen really discover the antidote for stress? The antidote for? Stress. Stress. He doesn't, he doesn't remember the episode. Oh, come on. It's a long time ago. <laughs> I don't have the right music in it. I know all about it. Um, <laughs> The national I pick. Think, I think, oh, you're talking about the newspaper headline, right? The newspaper, newspaper yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think that was the props department having a, uh, uh, having fun. Uh, I, do, I don't think, I certainly didn't do that. I would not purposely call attention to myself that way. Uh, but I think they thought it was funny. And it was. I mean, yeah. It was a great yeah. scene. Great scene. I love wow, it. if that's the question people are walking around asking after all this time, we're dead as a civilization. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> uh, is that is that what they really want to know? Oh, um, I should have closed on that question then. Maybe you should ask uh, another one, Shauna. <laughs> well, how about um, just you know we hear so much about the strife and the difficulties making the show and um, a lot of the you know frustrations, but any fun memories? Any um, oh, tons of tons of fun memories. Oh my yeah. god! Uh, um, Anything you can uh, share? Obvious highlights. <laughs> You know Orson Welles. Um, you know when he came and did the introduction to the the dream sequence always rings twice. The sound stage was filled with people, and they weren't all moonlighting people. I mean, people. You know th that this was Orson Welles, and and Jay came to me and said, "You have to direct this." And I said, "Why? Why?" And he said, "Because it's Orson Welles." And back then, he, he it was late in his life, and he had a reputation for being. Um, very difficult guy. So um, yeah. I dreamed up a thing with a prop guy. I said, if when I yell cut, if I pull on my ear, uh, drop something. The naked, <laughs> so I have to do it again. Oh, okay. Right. And uh, so we had this sort of code and we started working and he was, or someone was delightful. We'd get an ideal cut and say, would you like another? And I mean, it was just, well, that and to, you know, to, to even be breathing the same air he was breathing, to have that experience, yeah. you know, particularly at that age. And he, you know, he passed away shortly thereafter. Um, yeah. Stanley Donnan coming and directing um, the dance sequence, of, you know, Fantastic. Big Men on yeah. Mulberry Street. Um, Billy Joel writing the song and saying, hey, I wrote this song, would you guys want to use it? I mean, that was huge. Yeah. Huge. Yeah. Um, Whoopi Go I still remember Whoopi Goldberg had just been nominated for an Oscar for The Color Purple. And she called me and she went, I'd like to be on your show. And I was like, what? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and oh, can I bring my friend Judd Nelson? Uh, you know, I was like, okay. So um, yeah. There were so many amazing moments and we had such a great time. I'm, I still remember Bruce singing Good Lovin', you know, when we shot that. Yeah. I mean, that was just yeah. like a joy machine. Or at the end of the Christmas episode, when we, you know, turned oh, yeah. the walls around and you saw the cast and crew and we made, you know, snowfall. And, um, yeah. oh God. And, you know, working with the writers and look, I didn't know what I was doing. I was making it up. Uh, it wasn't like I'd been on a hundred shows and, you know. But you really on. broke the fourth wall with so many, a lot of walls actually. <laughs> so many well, different I, things that just weren't done. That too was stolen. I mean, George Burns was doing it yeah. in the 50s on, you know, and um, I really, the guy I sort of stole it from, not the guy, but the guys, was when I was a little kid on TV, they showed the old black and white road movies with Bing Crosby and Bob Hope. 
and they were forever turning to the screen and going, boy, I hope the guys at Paramount are okay with this. And then they go on to the next scene. And I just wow. thought it was funny as hell. And um, um, so, I don't know. Um, it'll, it'll be interesting, it'll, you know, it, it, um, but no, there's plenty, of, there's plenty of great memories, plenty of great yeah. memories. Um, and yeah, it was hard, but, but, but what, isn't, what isn't hard that isn't good, you know? And, you know, there are very few things in life that just happen and, you know, require very little effort. Um, and I was thrilled yeah. to be there. You know, and Bruce was thrilled to be there. And, and there was a lot of time I think Sybil was thrilled to be there, although she was less <laughs> demonstrative about it. Um, and, um, and now we have this wonderful group of shows to look back on, and, you know, and Elise and, you know, and, and Curtis and amazing guest stars. And, you know, when you look at the list of guest stars, it, sometimes, it, you know, it's, it's stunning. Um, oh, yeah. Everybody, as Bruce says, everybody was on Moonlighting. Yes, <laughs> everybody was people. on Moonlighting. Because I've just started, <laughs> I've just restarted watching Hill Street Blues. And honestly, every single episode of Hill Street Blues, there's a Moonlighting guest star. Oh, is that true? Mm, so far that I've been watching. Yep. That's interesting. Yeah. Um, I'm like, <gasps> I loved, you know, Stephen asked me to do it twice before I did Moonlighting. Come join us and do this with us, Stephen Bochco. Oh yeah, and yep. because I have a really golden gut for these things, and I knew, I said that show's never gonna make it, and that was the first time. And then it was renewed for season two and was up for all these Emmys. And yes. I thought, ah. <laughs> I just, um, but what an amazing show! It, it was a pretty amazing time too, because like I say, right after that you had Michael Mann, who was saying saying let's make television that looks and sounds completely different than anything else that's yeah. on television. Yep. And then I just sort of walked through the woods that they had just cleared out, you know, they had sort of laid mm -hmm. out the, the road for me. Um, so anyway, it is always incredibly flattering when people reach out the way you two have, and I'm grateful and so appreciate the attention. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, thank you so much for all the great episodes, for the characters. Um, You're welcome. Yeah, they paid I mean, me. They yeah. paid me. Uh, I've got to be honest with you. I didn't, Sean, I didn't even know you existed when I did it. But yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, you know yeah. what? You, yeah, you touched a lot of people, and a lot of people are still re really big Moonlighting fans. And I don't know if you get that from all of the other shows that you've done, but um, I think Moonlighting is something think, special. I think the most ardor is for Moonlighting, you know. Yeah. You know, in that certainly in the TV world and in the movie world, prom, clean and sober probably, but but yeah. Um, but certainly in, in television, and I think it's probably you hesitate to say the best show I've ever done because you feel like they're all they all have their virtues and stuff, and you did them in different ways and. They were all different mm -hmm. genres. I mean, Moonlighting is so extraordinary because I don't think it was a genre that people had experienced yeah. prior to that. And I did, that wasn't purposeful. It just was, it was sort of like doing jazz, you know? It's just, you mm -hmm. get in the room, and this is the music you're, you're playing. Um, mm -hmm. So. Um, and it was your first big hit. So that's yes. probably. Yes, it was you know. my first, yes. It was my first anything really. I mean, I'd worked on, half a season of Remington Steel and done an episode of Taxi. And it, I mean, yeah. it, it all happened very fast. And then two other pilots, as I mentioned at the beginning of this, but um, two, two other two hour pilots, but you know. And that's what I notice if you listen to our podcast, I, at the beginning, I'll say who the guest stars are and what they've been in and the directors and everything. And I just, there's a lot of crossovers, mm. you know, they were on, they were on Remington Steel or they were on Medium um yes so you, yes that, so do you have a lot of favorite actors that you use well once you discover an actor that you have simpatico with yeah sure you i mean i love to brag so i'll brag um on <laughs> medium uh i use this woman named riley stone who i thought was like amazing i want to say it was her first job and she 
she was so proud of what she did that she changed her name um, to Emma. Uh, so that no one would know that she had done media. Uh, and that Emma Stone and Jennifer Lawrence did two episodes yeah. of media. Wow. Uh, she played in one, she played young Patricia Arquette. Oh, um, yeah. And on Moonlight, I mean, the Moonlighting list is ridiculous. Tim, um, Tim Robbins Tim is Robin, in the Robin, Robin, yeah. in Dana the Delaney. They, uh, they, I just saw Dana, you know, she ended up doing an episode of Bowl for me as a favor. Oh, okay. Uh, Great. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. I'm crazy about her. Um, yeah, my my, came, my second daughter is named after her. Oh, really? Mm, Dana Delaney. She came by way of Bruce. Bruce, you know, I was writing the part, and he went, "Oh, I know somebody," you know, and he told me about Dana. <laughs> yeah, because they knew um, each other from New York. Yes, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, and he also, I have to give credit where credits do. That song, "This Old Heart of Mine," which he plays mm. when they get, that was Bruce. Who said yeah. oh, this song would work there? Um, it's funny that oh. I still remember that after all. Um, You're a great impersonator. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, anyway, I'll, I'll let you guys be. All right. Well, thank you very much for joining us today. We really appreciate uh, you taking the time to have a chat with us because uh, no, we, no, we're, we've been wanting to ask you these questions for so long. So. We're and so this, glad you've been on the show. And isn't the book great? Oh, yeah. I, I have nothing to do with it in terms of I'm not, you know, that's all Scott's thing. But, and when he first approached me, I was frankly sort of dubious, but I thought, okay, I'll do it. But I was so thrilled when I read it. Um, yeah, it's such great insight. Yeah, yeah to the show. Great. Yeah, amazing. And yeah, just a time capsule, you know, just, yeah. You know, keep the memories of the show you know yes yeah, it's great to get all the different memories from the different people and their different perspectives um right. on the show and their experiences so it was great anyway have a wonderful no. day Wait. i'll send you the yeah. link of the podcast when it's released as well just please so. thank you all right and yeah. also a link, a link to all that merch Absolutely. um yeah. <laughs> all right we'll do thanks all right. for joining us have a great have a great right. evening you too bye, bye bye Thanks, Glenn. Bye.